Welcome to the Creators Podcast. I'm Jonathan Hamill, a doctor and writer based in Paris. On this podcast, I will have conversations with guests from diverse fields, whether they excel in medicine, literature, sports, or comedy, they all epitomize excellence in their respective domains. Through these discussions, we will aim to uncover the common threads that connect these creators, delve into their passions, explore their mentors and work routines, and even touch upon the moments of doubts and the dreams that drive them. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome Heather Morris. Heather is a writer whose first novel, The Tattooist of Auschwitz, became a number one New York Times bestseller in 2018 and was translated into 60 languages, selling more than 12 million copies worldwide. Her next two books, also inspired by real-life characters, were released in 2019 and 2021. Silka's Journey and Three Sisters also became international bestsellers. She has also written a nonfiction book, Stories of Hope, in which she shares stories about her childhood and anecdotes about her special connection with Lali Sokolov, the tattooist of Auschwitz. Her new novel, Sisters Under the Rising Sun, will be released later this year. And this is an eventful year for Heather as production for a six-part miniseries based on The Tattooist has finally begun with the great Harvey Keitel as an older Lali. Before becoming a writer, Heather worked as a social worker at Monash Medical Center in Melbourne from 95 to 2017. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Monash University in Melbourne. You can find her on Instagram at Heather Morris Author and on her website, heathermorrisauthor.com. Heather, welcome to The Creators. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. It's an absolute pleasure to be talking to you. Thank you. So I wanted to start with uh, Lali Sokolov. Yeah. Uh, when you first met him, when your friend told you, I have a friend whose father uh, wants to tell his story, but he doesn't want to tell it to a Jew. Uh, that struck me when I when I heard of it. Uh, what impact did that statement have on you when you first heard it? Were you surprised? Did it strike you as unusual? No, not really. Um, I didn't know his reasons, of course, when I was first told. Working in a hospital, the large hospital like I did, it wasn't unusual for us to get requests from patients or their family members. Oh, can I have somebody who is of my faith? Or can I have somebody who is of my culture? Or race, and so that was an unusual request for me to hear. Mm. And this is—is is this something you discussed with uh, Lali when you first met him, or you, did you just not think about it that much? Oh no, absolutely. The very first day I met him, the the first thing I wanted to tell him was, I said, "I need to tell you my mother's maiden name, just in case it makes a difference to us chatting." And he looked at me and he said, "All right, what is it?" And I said, "It's Schwarzfeger." And he went, oh, you're German. And I said, no, I'm a Kiwi. And he said, okay, we can't choose our parents. I said, no, you have to tell me why you don't want to be talking to a Jewish person about your story. He said, because they have their own story. They have their own baggage. How can they write my story when they have their own? That made sense to me. Yeah, so he, he must have felt, maybe he would have felt uncomfortable sharing his his story and his own Yeah, his own problems and everything that happened to him was, was yeah, with someone yeah. with their own baggage, yes. It was, it was more, I think, Jonathan, that um, how could they write his story and not have so much background knowledge themselves? As he said, there can't be a person, a Jewish person alive who's not been touched by the Holocaust. Mm. Hearing their story may have just said, no, no, that's not what my grandmother told me. That's not what I've heard. So I think right. that's more where he is coming from. And is this also something that came up with uh, the later story, with the with Silka's journey and the three sisters, or is it different because you had already written uh, a first book? Oh, it, for the other one, particularly three sisters, it was because I had definitely written the other book. I had told it as far as Libby and Magda were concerned, faithfully, and they said, you know, you've told our story in telling that. So, yes, it was an absolute given that I had shown the respect to the story of Lully and I would show that same respect to their own story. But remember, I'm very much somebody who believes that, well, history and memory don't always walk side by side when they do part. Well, I'm going to go with the memory of the person who's telling me their story, even if I can't find 
history book or an academic piece to support it. Yes, the memory is the most important thing. And as, you, as you, you've told the uh, people who have interviewed you, you've written a Holocaust story and not, yes. it's not a history book. So that's, exactly. I guess, the most important. Yes. So it's quite obvious either by reading your books or even listening to your talks online that you have a gift for storytelling. Uh, but to write the books, the kind of books that you've written, uh, you also had to be a great listener because many of these stories were told to you either by Lali or by Silka's friends or relatives or by the, the, the sisters in Israel. And I, I was thinking, I can only imagine that working as a social worker in, uh, in Australia for uh, over 20 years has made you a good listener. Um, but I guess there's also more than that, because if you want to understand the true meaning of what people are trying to tell you, even especially if they're talking in uh, another language and you have a translator helping you, Uh, you have to be very observant, like reading the expressions, the micro expressions. Uh, so I was wondering, the question is, was it when you start, started working as a social worker, was it your personality that led you to the job as a social worker? Or did you change with the job? Did you have to, rec to learn these new skills of listening and observing? Look, I've always liked meeting people and growing up in a very, very small, it wasn't even a village really in New Zealand, where for all of my young life and into young adulthood, well, no, a teenager really, because I ran away about then, uh, I knew everybody and everybody knew me. There was never anybody interesting for me to, to know as a child. And uh, so for me, as soon as I got a chance to do something where I was going to be meeting strangers the public, whatever, hey, I was going for that. I just love talking to people like you. So what, what, but during your childhood, you uh, you talked to everyone, you know everyone's life story already in your, uh, your well, village? Well, yeah. Well, and that was much as they would tell me, and that was the frustrating part, that my parents, for example, you know, told me very little about their lives. They didn't want to talk about it. There was only one person in my life, one adult in my life, and that was my great-grandfather who ever really spoke to me and also who listened to me. Big difference there. Yes. Um, so when you started um, leaving, when you left, uh, then did you realize that people were very comfortable uh, confiding in you as you started going about the world? Um, look, I don't think I've had a problem with it. It certainly comes down to absolutely respecting every single person that you meet. And whether you want to believe what they're saying or not is immaterial. You don't get to ever call anybody out. It's just about being respectful. Yes. That's how I look at everybody. Mind, I suppose, yes. Yeah. Um, and once you started uh, working as a social worker, did you have uh, great uh, teachers, mentors who, who taught you a little bit more about this? Or is it just something that came about and you learned as you went Oh, well, of course, I had colleagues and my particular uh, boss, she was my boss for 20 years, the chief social worker there, Glenda Borden. She was amazing. And it was simply a matter of, you know, instilling in us that how can you possibly help somebody in the most tragic or traumatic time in their life if you don't shut up and listen? They don't want to hear your voice. They need to know that you're going to hear them. And it just seemed to become naturally that, I can't help somebody if I'm the one doing all the talking. So you were, you were listening a lot. Uh, yeah. it was it, were these uh, people you were seeing more than once, or it was it was in a, an emergency ward? Look, it was an acute hospital, and so there would be some people who I'd only see once or twice. There would be some others who you would see for weeks, months, and years because of their different illnesses. But for the most part, you know, you're meeting them, as I said, at that pivotal point in their, their life when something bad has happened. Uh, so, yeah, you've, you've, you've got to be able to listen, connect with them. Uh, and that's what we got 24 hours. Well, whenever I went to work, eight hours a day when working, you never knew what was coming through the door. You never knew what had come into that ward or that hospital overnight. So be prepared for anything and everything. So that's something that probably came in handy when you were talking to Lali. Uh, was that something he was specifically looking for or just something also when you got to know each other that he felt comfortable sharing his story? 
Yeah, he he wasn't interested in what I did when I first met him. Just as somebody who I think I'm going to like and I'm going to eventually want to tell my story to. And for, gosh, I imagine it was six, eight, ten weeks, can't quite remember, being with him two to three times a week and just listening to him talk. There were so many times when he'd start to say something and then he'd shut down. And I go, okay, this is too painful. Let's, I never, ever asked him to carry on. Just let it go. And then I decided that he didn't really know me. And what is the best way for him to get to know me? Well, let's take him home and let him meet my family and let them do their damnedest on him. Eh? Let them tell them what I was like. And, and that's what I did. I had three young adult children at the time uh, and hubby. And uh, yeah, he went home and by getting to know my family, he then got to know me. Right. Smart. <laughs> <laughs> and getting on with his dogs too. He had these two dogs who just were with us all the time. And uh, get along with the dogs, kids. Yeah. I was surprised. I heard that story on another interview because a lot of uh, survivors uh, were afraid of dogs uh, because the Nazi always, Nazis always mm -hmm. had dogs with them. For example, I know my grandmother was never comfortable uh oh. dogs yeah uh so i was surprised to see that he had a big dog and a small dog but i guess that depends on the person oh yeah he, he called them his kiddos they, yeah. they were his kids i want to talk about uh education a little bit i saw that your book uh the tattooist of auschwitz is now part of uh the school curriculum in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, which is amazing. And you also give lectures, uh, visit schools when you can. Yes. Um, according to the Executive Council of Australian Jewry's annual report on anti-Semitism in Australia, there was an increase uh, of anti-Semitic incidents of almost 42% over the last two years. Uh, actually, what is the current state of Holocaust education in Australia as of today? Is it compulsory now in, in high school and middle school? Yes, it is. And that statistic you just gave is really sort of uh, shocking to think that given that every child in the last probably at least generation, maybe generation and a half, have had to have Holocaust education, that uh, it just kind of begs the question, it's, it's not working, is it? Uh, I know strange, when I, yeah. Yeah, I'm now part of uh, the education board, and particularly in New South Wales and Sydney, and that's where the book is uh, on the curriculum there. And I've worked with the education board. I've done podcasts. I've done videos. I've done all kinds of um, films, not only for students talking to them, but also talking to the educators themselves, trying to suggest ways that they can get through to the, the young people they're talking to. And so it, it is going on. I just, um, yeah, I'm just horrified that uh, maybe I need to work harder. But what, what do the educators think is the, the, the cause of the problem? If you dis discuss this with them, do they have any idea? Well, it's a lack of education. Now, they're now trying to give it, but that doesn't help with uh, generations that they're still connected to who haven't had that education. And who's to say there's not an anti-Semitic sort of bias there already? You can only hope that um, these youngsters go home and have the courage to talk about it themselves. Is this something that came up? Uh, because I know now you know uh, a lot of uh, survivors from the Holocaust. Have you discussed uh, the rise in anti-Semitism with some of them? And what is their take on it? Yeah, uh, Yes, I have, particularly with my, my dear friend Livy, who is one of the sisters. Who's, she's the only one now still alive in Israel, and, and I'm in com communication with her and her family nearly every week. And uh, things in Israel, they've been sort of so pushed to a, a politically a different sort of level that um, the whole anti-Semitism thing sort of something that secondary right now to um, yeah, dealing with other things there. You know, when I do meet, there's not many more survivors left. That's the reality. Who I'm meeting are the second and third generation of them. And, yes, they're all really concerned, uh, both in the UK where I travel now, and the US seems to be a, a different ball game altogether. There is still, because I don't think that, the, well, I know they don't have the same level of education. But, um, yeah, there still is that concern. It's not only Holocaust 
uh, well, being anti-Semitic. They're the Holocaust deniers. And, and it's almost like it's got nothing to do with the fact that they're being anti-Semitic doing that. They just want to deny the Holocaust. They, yes. They're pretty much cowards. I call them out every time I come across one, which I do regularly. Yes, in the in the U uh, in the US, uh, uh, well, I'll be speaking to shortly on, on this podcast to the the actress uh, Juliana Margulis, mm-hmm. who was on on ER, and she has become very involved with the Museum of Jewish Heritage, which I know you you know because you've spoken there, and uh, they've launched a program called the Holocaust Educators School Partnership, where interns are taught how to teach the history of the Holocaust yes. to uh, middle and high school students in New York City. And a lot of them don't know, don't even know the, 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 what the Holocaust is. It's crazy. Uh, is this sort of program also uh, uh, available in Australia, in uh, New Zealand, teaching teachers how to teach? Well, I've done a bit of it, but I'm a layman and I'm, and I'm not Jewish. So I come from a background of being able to just give the, the opinion of somebody who just can't understand why it exists in the first place. So let's just talk about it from that level, not because I can bring my own stories uh, to hand, other than Lully's and, and Silker and, and the, the sisters. But um, when it comes to educating kids and talking to kids, I've found that the best way to get their attention is to say to a classroom, how many of you are 15 years old? How many of you are 16? And as soon as they identify with that age group, which they all do, I said, now let me tell you a story about young boys and girls your age. And and when I'm telling it to you, you think of yourself in their position and that they really connect with the fact that they're not talking about the Holocaust, they're now talking about young people of their age and what happened to them for no other reason other than because of the, they were Jewish. That seems to get the, the non-Jewish kids hooked straight away. Yeah. And what, what what are some of the questions that that come up in the, in those in that context once their their attention is grabbed? One of the one, one of the most surprising questions you've heard. Oh look, I, had, I was doing this lovely chat in in um, the UK at a school, and then this this girl just stays in my memory. That brought two three schools together, so there was about five hundred students of that um, certain age level. And we were just talking. I just talk conversationally. I don't lecture and I go. I don't stand on a stage. I get down with them and I ask them, particularly children, if you say to them, oh, you put your hand up and ask me a question, interrupt me. There's no point in me prattling on when I say something you don't get and you have to wait till the end. So I won't do that. Let's have a chat. And there was a young girl that was halfway down the, the, the hallway and every now and then her hand would go up. And then as soon as I looked at her, she'd pull it down again and drop her head. This happened several times and questions were coming everywhere. So in the end, I just walked up to her and I sort of said, would you like to meet me afterwards? And we'll have a little chat and you can ask me your question. And initially she said, yes, that would be good. And as I walked away from her to go back towards the front, she stood up and she called out and she said, no, I'm going to ask it now in front of everybody. I went, good girl. So I gave her a microphone. I said, you ask your question. And she said, what did girls do when they had their period? And I went, thank you. I've been That's speaking for several years and no one has ever asked me that question before. Now let's answer it. Thankfully, I knew the answer. Yes, well, many, many of them didn't have them anymore. <laughs> Well, that's right, but initially that they did, and the new ones coming in still did. So it was an ongoing problem for, yeah. for the SS. That's a great question. <laughs> so I wanted to come back to uh, to Lali because he seemed such a lively and great character. And uh, can you tell us about the time after the war when uh, he and Gita were living in Bratislava? And after all the trouble he was in, he got into trouble and they had to escape to Vienna in the false wall of a truck because that seems like a great story. So what can you tell us about that? Oh, look, indeed. Uh, he admit, he was always a risk taker. He, he was always somebody who, he said, he always looked out for wherever he went. He never took a step without looking around where are the dangers, but fully admits that there were many times that he was stupid. Now, for him, the most stupid thing he ever did even though it paid out well for him, was to write that first letter to Gita. 
Haystor was hitting himself around the head 80 years later that he'd done that and potentially could have, uh, you know, literally ended her life by doing that. But uh, yes, he, uh, he was a savvy guy. He saw a need when he got back to Bratislava and they were started uh, living their life there and he saw an opening and started a very successful business. So successful he had to get a business partner that that business partner played up with, um, with his marriage. And she then squealed on him because one of the things Lully and Geta were very, very clear about doing was helping the state of Israel. Now, so many of their friends had gone there to literally be there and take part in creating that state. They chose not to, but the least they could do would be to fund it. Now, today he'd probably be called a terrorist and absolutely thrown in jail for funding uh, another country. <laughs> but that's what he was doing, smuggling money and, and jewellery, whatever he could out of the country. He was part of an organisation. He wasn't doing it alone. And yes, he got caught and uh, thrown in jail. So, so that's yeah. that's when he had to escape. <laughs> well, Gita was the one responsible for that. Uh, he managed to see her and just said, "You you've got to get me out of here." And she formulated the plan that involved a priest, a psychiatrist, uh, and a judge. So she bribed a judge, and he's he, and sitting with him and hearing him tell me how. This guard came into his cell one day. He sort of said, oh, the priest is here to see you. And I'm saying, I don't want to see any priest. You know, send him away. So three times he sent this priest away. So in the end he went, all right, all right, I could do with talking to somebody new. So he went and spoke to the priest who then said, to him, I need to hear his confession, kicked out the guard, and he said, your wife has sent me. Come on, work with me here, man. So, yeah, they then worked with a psychiatrist to get him home leave. And uh, on that home leave, that was when it was all planned that they would smuggle the two of them out. Seems like another short story altogether. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so I wanted to spend some time uh, talking about your your book writing process. Uh, I really love your books. I've read a bunch of them. And I think you have a great writing style. But I was surprised because before turning uh, Lally's story into a novel, you were writing it as a screenplay and you had never published a book before. Uh, so I was wondering how much writing you'd done uh, prior to starting the work on the book. Uh, did you have a diary or some other form of a writing routine that you've been doing for years? No, quite the opposite. I didn't know what no. I was doing. And my publishers told me that many times. It, it really was a matter of, Getting to that point in my age, and, and you probably heard me say this, where my children are now saying to me, hey, mum, can I have the car keys? Not, can you drive me somewhere? And having that time on my hands where I went, what do I want to do for me now? And I was still working full time. And so, yes, I love movies. I'm a huge fan of movies. Most recently seen The Little Mermaid, <laughs> said six-year-old granddaughter. But... I found that writing screenplays, once I started looking into it, that they came with a formula and they came with rules. I don't follow rules, or so I thought. So that's why I went down that path of trying to learn the structure and how to craft out a screenplay. Three acts, nice and simple, follow the rules, can't go wrong. Pushing go wrong. <laughs> the talented screenwriters that we have out there, I wouldn't even dream of, of putting my name in with theirs. And how did you uh, learn these rules? Did you, uh, did you take a class or just by reading the screenplays? Well, I did several online um, courses. And uh, also during the weekend, a couple of weekends, I went to those sort of two-day sort of seminar workshops that the film sort of companies here in Australia were running. And there's quite a well-known, well, he's, a, he's an author. He's written probably the most successful book about writing screenplays called Sid Field. He wrote a book called Story. And he came to Australia and I signed up and did his his class too. So me, it was about, but it really does come down to literally finding a genre or a story you like or a movie you like. Every single movie since Charlie Chaplin, the script can be downloaded. You can read them. They don't cost anything. And so watch the movie, get the screenplay, read the screenplay, now watch the movie again and just learn through that process. Yeah, I've I've done that actually. It is quite yes. fascinating. Yes, 
so once you turned it into a, a novel, did you also look for rules for structure uh, in other books about writing? Uh, thinking about the great book on writing by Stephen King or the story grid by Sean Coyne, who also breaks down uh, books into uh, scenes and acts and everything, or did you just adapt the screenplay? Pretty much adapted. Uh, I'm, it was an interesting period when I got published as sort of as soon as I decided to do it. That's another story. And um, they said to me, this is a memoir, so you have to write it as a memoir. And I went, oh, okay, I don't know how to do that. It just so happened that in Melbourne where I was living, that a few weeks later there was going to be a memoir writing course. So I took some time off work. It was to go for five days. I went to it for one day. And I came home and went, I'm not going back because I knew that the few rules I'd learned about writing a memoir did not suit me to tell Lully's story. So I told the publishers and they said, well, all right, then just write it in the third person. I kind of rolled my eyes at that and went, yeah, all right, I'll give it a go. So I started writing a few sort of pages and sending it to them. And that's when I got the the email back from my, my publisher in London, the beautiful Kate Parker, who simply said, you don't know what you're doing, do you? And I'm like, nope. That's reassuring. <laughs> and um, so she, in the end, she had faith in me and she just said, well, why don't you just tell the story the way you want it told? So, yeah, that's why I don't seem to adhere to any real kind of rules or formula because I don't know that. And, hey, listen, I'm too old to start learning some church because I'll stick with the tricks I've learned <laughs> or adapted. So, so you got a publishing deal uh, between... Uh, the screenplay and starting to write the book. Is that how, how it happened? Well, it ha happened because I was stubbornly and stupidly, I hung up onto the idea of it being a film, big screen, little screen. I didn't care for way too long. Or maybe it was the right length of time because I wasn't trying to write a book. And uh, I was just visiting my uh, brother and sister-in-law in San Diego in California. And it was my sister-in-law one night who said to me, she said, oh, for goodness sake, just write the bloody thing as a book and get on with it. And I went, oh, okay, I'll give it a go. And it was as simple as that. But then I decided, well, I was talking to my kids when I got back to Australia, um, one of my sons in particular who makes short films. And I said, yeah, I've got to get a publisher now. I don't know how to do that. And he said, well, why don't you do what, what we did in one of our films that we were making, and that's go crowdfunding. So he, we got onto Amazon, who were the first ones with their Kickstarter, and very early days. And uh, yeah, I sat down, Cubby put the video on me for a little bit, had a little chat, told everybody what I had, shoved it up on Amazon's Kickstarter crowdfunding platform, where it can still be seen today, and um, publishers came to me. Nice. <laughs> well, I have yet to get a rejection letter, Jonathan. Oh, well, I have plenty of those I can show you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when you uh, when you write when you start writing, uh, uh, who's the first person to, her, first person sorry to read uh, what you what you're writing your new novel? Do you wait till you're basically uh, done uh, with the book, or just Jeff? Do you have someone read it as you go along? Yeah, no, she's my editor um, in London, and yeah, she'll be getting every sort of chapter and sometimes other bits and pieces thrown in. Uh, I, look, I have to admit up front that without the brilliant team that I have around me, particularly in the editorial area at Bonnier, that uh, these books wouldn't have seen the, the light of day. They are just so brilliant at being able to say, no, no, look, you're deviating away, cut that out. But um, in terms of any kind of structure, writing screenplays teaches you that, doesn't it? It teaches you you've got three acts and you've got to get X done in the first 10 pages and then you've got the next 40% to do Y. So I try and follow that. But then I also read this great piece of advice from the screenwriter William Goldman. Uh, when writing books like this that have got a historical or, or a real sort of fact behind them, research, 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 you know, throw the bloody research away and write the thing. Mm. Yeah, and really, that's what I do. I very I don't have anything big, around me. Yeah, when I'm writing it, if it's not up here, how can it possibly go on the page for you to be able to understand? 
And since you've started writing, I guess you've had the opportunity to write to to meet some of the writers uh, that you've admired for some time. Um, have you talked about the writing process? Have you gotten any uh, advice from any of them? If you've met any, I suppose. Look, I've met one or two, and COVID kind of interfered with that, didn't it? And kept me bad. Two of my books came out during COVID times, which was oh, wow. very frustrating. But um, I had uh, spent some wonderful time and was in South Africa, actually, with the English uh, author Simon Seabag Montefiore. Now, he's historical, we all set in, of course, Russia and that part of the world. But he's very, very generous. Uh, but when I was reading his things, his material and, and trying to relate it to mine, I'm going, yeah, this guy is so brilliant. I'm not even going to try and do anything like he does. He was still very, very um, uh, warm and, and, and helpful to me. Uh, I remember there was the American, I think she's American, but she's from uh, Russian extraction, Paulina Simons. And she's written historical fiction books for the last 20 years, going back, all coming out of, of course, Russia. And uh, she came to Australia and I was asked if I'd do a joint thing with her, and I did. And once again, she's just so giving in terms of bits of advice and how to do things. So, uh, I've never met an author yet who wasn't sort of you know, warm and welcoming. Yes. Yeah, the most talented people often are the yeah. most giving. It's great. I love going to book festivals. I think they're brilliant. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the research because I know even for For the first book, now I understand because you had a publisher, so you were able to get researchers, I suppose. But I wanted to th talk about uh, the research you've done for Silka's Journey, where you hired a prof professional Russian researcher in Moscow. Yes. You traveled to Silka's hometown in Slovakia. You met with Silka's neighbors and friends in Kosice. Uh, amazing array of people that you've met. Um, How do you use the work of your researchers? What's the process exactly? Do you give them specific points to check on or you just tell them, go there and see what you can find? How does it work? You look, with me, with, particularly with Silka, which is where I've used the most research because Silka, I never got to meet her, so I had to. And also the fact that a you know, large chunk of her story is set in Siberia. And so having Svetlana in Moscow, who I just sort of said, find out everything you can about Vorkuta, gulag no other gulags don't don't go messing up with my little brain with telling me what went on in other gulags only Volkuta. and so that was her brief i wanted photos documents testimonies anything and everything she could get and she did she found a mountain of things in the archives in moscow and i remember writing to me one day and she said oh look i've been told that there's a lot of documents still up in Volkuta. They never came down to Moscow. So I said to her, oh, look, could you just sort of nip up there and get them for me then, please? And she wrote back saying, please don't ask me to do that. It's a three-day train trip from Moscow to Vorkuta. There is no plane. There is no real road. It's still incredibly isolated. And uh, so she begged me not to send her up there, so I didn't. But uh, in finding... Her, I then, because I've now got a lot of friends in Slovakia through Lali's story, particularly in his hometown, I have the, them, they're more friends, they're not professional researchers. Can you go into Kosita? Can you go to Sabinov and Badashov and find me people who, who know, who knew Silka's family? So they are brilliant because they love doing this. But my, um, my researchers, they, they get to find all the factual information, the documents, the photos. But when it comes to talking to anybody who's got some story they can tell me about them, then that's my job. I'm going to do that one. So yeah. on a plane, off to Slovakia, and you know I've been in yeah. Slovakia twice this year already. But... Wow! <laughs> so now you go visit because you have friends there. It's great. I have friends there, and um, just dropping the hint that 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 may be where we've just been filming a mini series for the last five months. So. <laughs> oh yeah. So, yes, that's finally happening, right? The, it's happened. Actually, it's all filmed. It's all filmed. Oh, great. It's, it's so mm -hmm. did you did you have, uh, I guess you were part of the production or the whole process? How, were you, I guess you were involved at some point. How did that uh, yeah. happen? 
Well, because I contracted to make sure that I was not going to hand this material over and let somebody go rogue on me. And so I do, do have the title of the script consultant. So I, do, I have not written any of these scripts. They've been written by three screenwriters, one in Australia and two in England. And these three brilliant, brilliant screenwriters with huge, wonderful credentials to their names in both countries. So they they write the scripts, they send them to me, and I go, no, 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 can't do that. Take that out. Yeah, it's and job. then they'll ring me up and say, look, can we just tweak this? I know you don't want it. And so there's it's been quite collaborative. Well, it has to be between the producer and me in terms of what I have given them permission to play around with and, and what I've said no to, but they've, they've been brilliant. It's, a, yeah, yeah, six it's episodes. not always that, that easy. So I guess you, you, you had a good deal. So I've heard like some stories of books being adapted, changed completely, and the author mm -hmm. doesn't have to say. So but I guess that... Well, that I wasn't works. going to have that. And as you've mentioned, there have been you know, over 12 million copies sold. Well, you can triple four times that, the number of people who've actually read it. So that actually tells you the number of people worldwide who've read it. Why would you want to mess with that? Exactly. Why would you want to you know, pay them off by trying to do your own thing and you know, thankfully the producer and the beautiful director that uh, we had they said no we want to tell the story that is so well loved uh, did you go on set uh, did you mm -hmm. go and meet with the actors a little bit mm -hmm. how was that pretty amazing because it's something way outside my normal um my lifespan but um i've spent time thankfully with the the two actors that are playing lully because he's being played both as, as the young man in Auschwitz and as an older man uh, by Harvey, as you mentioned. So, yeah, hanging out with Harvey Keitel, he's a, quite a cheeky little darling. Um, and the young actor, Jonah Hauer um, King, who is playing the young man, is just brilliant. He is superb. And all the supporting casting, the producers have gone to incredible lengths to cast, you know, a German actor as Beretsky, a French actor as Pepin. We've got uh, Jewish girls from Poland and Israel who are playing the other parts. And uh, the young girl who's playing Silke, for example, mm, there may be people listening to this for whom the name will not mean anything, but the most loved and revered uh, Israeli actor is called Topol. And... Uh, his granddaughter, her first acting role, is playing Silka. Wow. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So w when will this come out? I don't have an exact date. Of course, it's just going into um, uh, post-production, and that's up to the, the networks and NBC and Sky and other people. A few months. Hopefully, hopefully they're saying, I think they're saying in the first quarter of next year. It's okay. all about timing. You, you don't bring... Uh, stories out during like Christmas when people are, are, are traveling in a way or through summer when they're not watching TV. So it's all about programming. Uh, they, they'll figure it out. <laughs> they'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't have a, a, a cameo? No. <laughs> nope. Not wasn't interested in that. Thank you very no. much. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, I was wondering, since you've mentioned that uh, three times the number of 12 million, so that's a lot of people who've read the story. Uh, you must have gotten a lot of letters uh, from all the books, uh, from readers from all around the world. Uh, can you think of one or two that have really surprised you or touched you more than others, either but because of the person writing or the content, just off the top of your head? Oh, the, oh look, I can. Um, there are literally thousands. It's not dozens. It's not hundreds. It's thousands. Oh, wow. And there's hardly a week goes by or even a day goes by that I still don't get them. They're, they're still coming. Uh, and um, you know, one of the ones that, oh, gosh, will stick with me forever was a young boy, well, a young man who wrote to me during COVID. It was, I think, about the June or July of 2020, and I got this email from this young man who lives in Milan in Italy. And he wrote to me saying that he had been stuck in his apartment for about three months, not had been allowed out. And he was in an apartment with his mother and father and 16-year-old sister. All around him, his family and friends were dying because Milan got hit really bad. 
and he lost all four of his grandparents in those first few months to COVID. So he wrote telling me this, and he said that a couple of nights earlier, his parents had called him to dinner, and he said, what's the point? No, I'm not going to, because we're just all waiting here to die. He really believed that, was just waiting his turn. And his 16-year-old sister went up, went to her room, and came out and gave him the tattoos to Auschwitz. She said, here, read this. I bet you'll think differently when you do. He hadn't slept. He had just read it. And he wrote to me, thanking me for having written it, and said to me, I know I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go out, get out of here and have the best life I can because Lully and Gita taught me that. And, and he has and he did and they've kept in touch a bit. But uh, it's just wonderful. Now, that's the effect of how. Now, the other story uh, of people who write to me, again, are the young ones, the teenagers, the 14, 15, 16-year-olds. So many of them not only write and, and, and tell me about their story, they want to share something about their own lives with me, which is just so humbling. And so I, I love that. And so many of them have written to me and said, here's my mum's email address. Can you write to her and tell her she has to take me to Auschwitz? Wow. And, and I know from having been at Auschwitz and talking to one of the senior guides there who said to me, we, we love your book and we hate your book because so many people are now coming here and saying, can you show us where Lully and Gita were? They are focused on the story, but they've only come because of the book. I mean, that's pretty phenomenal, Jonathan. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. Wow. Thank you for sharing these stories. They're great. Um, I just I want to talk about your book, Stories of Hope, because you were talking about people sharing their stories. Um, what was the moment when you decided you wanted to write more about yourself? Was this after the first two books, first three books? Yeah, really wasn't me that decided that. It was my publishers. Um, I was in Koshita with my, my, my main editor, publisher, uh, Margaret, and we had spent you know, the whole day sitting in this apartment right next door to Silka's. The Silka had lived in the same apartment for about 40 years, and we were next door with this elderly couple who knew her, and that was all arranged by from friends from Lali's hometown of Kompoki, and throughout the day, people were coming in from the apartment and they were friends and neighbours who had known Silka for decades. And they were crowding this apartment, all sitting there wanting to talk to me and tell me about her. Now, I had two translators there because I don't speak much Slovakian. I'm the Jacquem, thank you, is about the best I can do. They didn't speak any English, so it was all going through translators. And my publisher was sitting there with me and we talked for hours, eight hours, and we were going back the next day to do more. So that, that night after the first chit-chat, sitting in the hotel bar where we were staying in Koshita, and my publisher, Margaret, said to me, she said to me, she said, I was just blown away watching those people talk to you. They didn't know you. They're opening up to you. She said, a couple of times I asked a question and they kind of glanced at me and then turned away. Mm why is it that they were prepared to tell you anything and everything, even without you asking? And I just said, like, I don't know. I couldn't answer it. I'm probably on my third or fourth glass of wine by then. Mm. And then she said, well, you, you, you must know how to listen. She said, I could see it. I was watching you and watching them. Who taught you how to listen? Now, that was a no-brainer for me, and I just immediately blurted out, oh, my, my gramps, my great-grandfather. He... I spent time with him every day after school for years as a young child. And um, he was the one who said, you've got to listen, girly, as he called me. Listen to the sounds around you. Listen to everything. And so I had this incredible, you know, growing up of this one man who taught me, shut up and listen, girly, and you'll hear the world. As he was telling his stories? Yes. Well, not only his stories, there would be some days when he didn't talk. Now, he had a really rich history. You know, he'd been a young New Zealand uh, boy who had ended up going to South Africa to fight in the Boer War underage and been part of the, the, the village that we were growing up in. He'd been sort of part of that for you know, decades he was, oh, in his 80s. But um, 
there would be days when he'd just sit there and we'd sit there in silence. Oh, I thought it was silence. And then he'd say to me, what do you hear? And I'd say, nothing. And he said, don't be silly. What do you hear? Now listen. And I'd go, oh, I can hear a dog barking. And he said, all right, so which, because it would be after school, which is the time for rounding up the cows to bring them in for their milking or sending them out of the, the milk yard. He said, oh, which dog is it? And I went, oh, I don't know. He said, well, think about it and listen harder because there would be more than two or three dogs. And I'd go, oh, okay, it's, it's Pepe. And he went, yeah, he's going to get a boot up the bum from your dad later on, isn't he? Because he's by snapping at the cows. So it, he was teaching me how to identify the sounds that I could not see but they were all around me in this quiet little farm. Neighbour's tractor. Whose tractor is it? Ah, that's the carpers. Good. You now know the sound. Now we know how you learned how to listen. Yes. <laughs> listen to, there's always a noise somewhere. You might just think of it as white noise, but if you actually listen to it, you can identify sounds within it. And on your website, that's when you started to you did, to uh, to make your website available to uh, people who wanted to tell these stories. Is that yes. how it happens? Yes. Yes. Well, then they, they I said, look, write a book. I think you should you know, take a break from from writing the, the fiction. And uh, it took quite a bit of convincing for me to do this. By the way, it wasn't something I wanted to do. Uh, I pretty much am quite a private person, and um, you won't hear me talk much about my family. But I got persuaded to do it by bringing in, of course, Lully and others. And so that seemed to be an, an okay in for me to do that. And so when the book was about to come out, we started getting, or it did, we started getting letters again. Once again, um, I've got a story. And so that's when we started the website. And, you know, we've got hundreds and hundreds of incredible emails. We interact with everyone who writes to us. My um, wonderful publishers in England offer editorial help to anybody we say would you like to write this story because they are all short stories about something in their lives a young girl in, in america whose brilliant 25 year old brother in the last year of his um, medical training who was a collateral damage in a drive-by shooting you know how, how do i go on how do i move past the fact that my brother who was going to offer so much to the world is no longer with us these are the sorts of things we get so we say to them, write it down. So many of them now get editorial help. They rewrite them with professional editors, enter them in competitions, even though they're personal stories, or they just simply write to us and say, look, it was just cathartic to be able to write it and know that somebody was going to read it. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's a, 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 th a sort of a therapy just by writing, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And do you ever see any of those stories and think, wow, that's too amazing. I have to write a book about it. Um, way too many as far as my publishers are concerned. <laughs> um, there have been one or two uh, which have been taken and working with that person who wrote that story. Other ghost writers uh, are working with them. Uh, because I'm, what do they say? You know, you, you're not a writer for hire. I don't want to take on that role as well. So I'm very happy that as long as these stories are being told and if they start by having written to me in the first place, well, that's just wonderful, but hmm. So I wanted to digress for a moment and talk about uh, hammer throwing because I saw on your website. <laughs> <Shoulders. laughs> <Like> hammer throwing. <laughs> when, uh, when did the hammer throwing uh, become part of your life? Is that, how did, what's the process? <laughs> Well, I've been involved in athletics through my children for years and years. Well, my, my children are, are athletes, you know, starting at the age of five years, right up and through all the junior and into seniors as athletes. So my son's at 40-something years now, still does triathlons. And so for us, uh, act activities around athletics was a big part of our life. And uh, once again, I was watching my kids out there sort of throwing these uh, hammers and javelins, and I went, oh, I could do that. I joined a group of we've called um, masters, so you know, over fifty year olds, and it's a huge you know, international organisation, Masters Athletics. So I joined a local club for that, and yeah, just specialised in discus shot, javelin, hammer. Oh, so it's not only don't hammer. ask oh. me to run a hundred meters. I'm going to. But you can throw things. <laughs> I can throw things. 
Uh, so is this is something you still practice today? No, not so much because I kind of did my shoulder, my rotor cuff oh. on my shoulder, but um, uh, I'll come back to it. It's just yeah. a matter of time. I'm actually taking my eight-year-old grandson tomorrow morning, Saturday morning here, down to a park with a shot and a discus because he's got a school athletics on Tuesday and he's eight and he wants to, you know, I've been training him. He can nice. run like crazy, but um, he, he needs coaching and, and the throwing. Uh, part of the reason I ask is because uh, writing uh, can be very sedentary and uh, solitary in some, in some cases activity. Uh, when you are actually sitting down writing the book, uh, do you make it a point to, uh, to have some sort of uh, physical routine or you just write for 12 hours a day? What, what's your writing routine once you actually sit down? If you ask my publishers, I'd say very clearly she doesn't have a writing routine. You know, we give her deadlines and she meets them and how she gets it done, that's a big mystery to everybody. Um, I'm, I'm very good at, um, I don't procrastinate so much because I don't have trouble writing, but I can get distracted. I freely admit that. So the best time for me not to be distracted is from about 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. Mm. I can't see the bird flying past the window. My daughter doesn't want me to go shopping with her. Uh, somebody doesn't want anything from me. So really I do write in, at those hours and I, I'm a night person, so it works fine for me. But uh, this latest book, I knew that I was getting, I hadn't had a good start on it and it was coming into summer here last December. And I went, summer, Brisbane, five grandkids nearby. I've got to get out of town. So I moved to London for two months. So through the first two months of this year, I sat in this lovely apartment in Soho. Oh, no distractions in London, are, are there? Um, but um, but I, I did knock it off. <laughs> Just someone locked you in. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, so since I guess your how has your life changed, sorry, uh, since, uh, if at all, since you've uh, started writing as a career and sold so many books Have you uh, indulged in any fancy stuff when you started selling millions of books or have you just kept on no. doing exactly the same? No, same same routine. My home life is, is the same as it was. The difference is, though, Jonathan, is now that COVID's gone away, kind of, that I'm back traveling and I just love that. I love being anywhere in the world, meeting people, whether we speak the same language or not, it doesn't matter. I'm very good now at, uh, at dealing with translators and interpreters. I know how to, to work with them quite well. And I'm so lucky to have my books, as you said, in many, many countries, which means I get invitations to go to them all the time. And, and I say yes to every possible one. And that, that's, that's what's changed. So it's not a bad third act of my life because that's really what I'm in, the third act. I turned 70 you know, a month ago, so... So no Which Ferraris. Is, <laughs> no Ferraris. No, no, no. I have the same car that I've had for about five years. And no, that's not changing. <laughs> no. Why? I mean. <laughs> exactly. Why? <laughs> Why would you do it? <laughs> yeah. I might fly at the front of the plane now a little bit. Well, on, you long, on long haul. Only on long haul. Yes. Uh, what uh, can you tell us about your new book, because uh, I know there's a new book called Sisters Under the Rising Sun. It's coming out later this year, right? Oh, yeah, in September. I'm so excited about this one. Uh, it's a story which I've kind of had in the back of my mind for several years when I think I was finished writing Silka and I hadn't quite, I hadn't known about the three sisters. And I uh, was talking to, to, to my publisher in London and I sort of said, look, I'd, I'd like another story. I like, of course, what I call recent historical fiction. So it's still within that sort of living memory of the people still alive from the Second World War. Not too many. And she said to me, she said, I heard a story about some Australian nurses who were captive of the Japanese in the jungles in Indonesia during the Second World War. Do you want to look into that? So when I had a chance and, and I'd finished writing Three Sisters, And uh, I had a contract to write another book. I immediately went to that. And I started doing my own just vague research, not quite sure where it was going to go. But what I was uncovering was just an incredible story of these nurses 
I caught up with a colleague from the hospital where I used to work and uh, I was telling her about it. I said, oh, yeah, I'm thinking about writing the story. And she said, but one of those nurses was my cousin. What do you want to know? And I went, which one? And she said, oh, Nesta, Nesta James. And so all of a sudden I've got a family member of what was the senior nurse in that prisoner of war camp for three years and eight months. In the jungle. So in, in, in researching her and getting all the other stories, and there's not much been done, what I uncovered was that there were a group of English women and Dutch nuns in the same camp whose stories, again, are phenomenal. Now, there's an English woman. Well, I've chosen just one, so I picked Nora, who is Nora Chambers. She was an English woman. She'd been living in Malaya, got chased out of Malaya with her family, her husband and an eight-year-old daughter, got to Singapore. Her husband's sick. He gets put in hospital. Um, these, these are not spoiler alerts. I'm quite happy for this information. And so as the Japanese are now invading Singapore, she puts her eight-year-old daughter on a boat and sends her off with her sister and their two young cousins. It was the last she saw of that girl for four years. That four-year-old girl had been told that both her parents were dead. And then as it happened in Singapore on the second to last day as the, as the Japanese were bombing and taking over Singapore, the nurses, 65 nurses, and a whole group of mostly English women and men and some soldiers and children all boarded the same boat, same merchant ship. 48 hours later, they were attacked and bombed and the boat was sunk. So primarily my story is about these women who were then finally washed up on the beach of Sumatra, caught by the Japanese the next three and a half years, imprisoned by them, moving deeper and deeper into the jungle. Wow. Nora, this brilliant, brilliant Nora, she had trained at the Royal Academy of Music in London. Really? She was a gifted musician beyond all belief. You know, at born today, she would be a, a, an international you know, name. And after they tried to do things to keep themselves occupied, where she came into being was she started forming choirs along with uh, one of the missionaries, English missionaries. So they were entertaining the, the women, the other women in the camp. The Australians were putting on plays and skits and taking the mickey out of the, the, the Japanese. Um, and the Japanese soldiers used to come to their concerts. And then Nora, this is, this is where we now go to another level. Nora wanted something different. She wanted to form an orchestra, but they had no instruments. So she created what's called a vocal orchestra. She trained women to sing Brahms, Mozart, Tchaikovsky, Handel, Raval, perform their music with their voice. And she knew uh, all the all the parts. She wrote them down. She used to write it. She got scrap bits of paper, and she and we've got copies of her brilliant. In fact, I've seen because I, uh, her daughter, that eight year old girl. Um, I got to meet her in Jersey on the Channel Islands um, la middle of last year and again in January. And she has given us documents and pages and photos, incredible amount of wonderful material from her mother. That's amazing. <laughs> it makes me think of uh, Theresian style a little bit in the, because of all the music and the plays yes. that, were, that were going on. Um, yes, and yeah, literally hundreds of these women died in those camps. Of the 65 nurses who boarded that boat on that day, on the 12th of February, 1942, only 24 made it home. But well, um, can't wait to read it. <laughs> yes, and there's lots of other bits and subplots all within I'm it. Of sure. Sure. Mm. But finding the, so you found, you actually found some of the sheet music that she had kept in Jersey? Well, yes, a lot of it. The, the Nora had kept it when, when they were liberated uh, eventually. Um, and, you know, the, the war had actually ended and they didn't know it because they're in the middle of the jungle and the Japanese weren't saying anything. Um, but, yes, she took a lot of that away with her and we've got it and we've upheld the original documents and we'll have some of them in the book where we'll show you what this brilliant woman did and in terms of writing music, pages and pages of it. 
Yeah, how and, did you uh, find? Uh, how did she write it down? She, I mean, I guess all the details you will you will share in the books, but I book. will. I'm just just give me a second. I'll try and hold up something for you to see. Let me just say something. All right, this is taken from another book, but I'm not sure if you can see that there. That's part of Bolero. Yes, yes, and that's what she wrote. Wow, and she and she wrote dozens of different scores like that on scrap bits of paper. It looks like it's taken out of a normal, uh, normal music book. Amazing. Yes, she's a, she, she's a brilliant lady, and and so by being able to perform, she was able to create an atmosphere, or they all were, that just helped lift the spirits of the women. They were terrible conditions they were surviving in, just shocking. Starved, beaten, um, a disease was rampant because it's tropical. Yep. Mm. Amazing. Thank you for sharing all this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, something I saw on uh, on your website. I think Submit to Love Studios, that's a collective of uh, artists uh, living with brain injury who partnered with uh, Bonnier Books UK to put their spin on some of the, the book covers. Um, yeah. I think the new rendition of uh, The Tattooist is great. And it made me think that once your book comes out, as we were saying, it's really out of your hands how many how many people it touches and how it touches people. Uh, we've, t we've talked a, bit, a little bit about it, but what are the most surprising, some of the most surprising ways uh, you've, books have touched people, not only the tattooist, but any of the others? Well, there's that beautiful piece of artwork, as you're seeing, and it hangs proudly in Bonnie Ear's office, not mine, um, which is fair enough, I see, for everyone to see. But look, here's another story. I mean, these are just, and, and oh gosh, there are so many I could throw at you from so many different countries, from South Africa to, to Belgium to in between. But um, a year or two after, after Bloody story came out. I got an email one day from the warden of a prison in South London. And he, he wrote and told me that a couple of prisoners had read Bloody Story in the, uh, the library, because they were a library in this, this prison. This is a maximum security prison. So I think there's 1,500 men in it. It's huge. But he wrote telling me that they'd never seen a book have an effect on prisoners like these two or three men who read it, who were going out and telling other prisoners about this dude called Lully, who was in prison like they were. And when he got out, he had a great life. And this the, the, it created momentum amongst other prisoners. And they were saying to um, each other when they were feeling down, just be like Lully, you know, we're going to get out of here. We will get out. And so he wrote telling me this and he asked me would I write an, uh, a, a letter and he would have it printed in the, the prison sort of gazette or whatever it was. And I, I wrote back saying, well, actually, I'm coming to London in a few weeks' time. You know, maybe I can stop off and have a cup of tea or something. <laughs> How naive can you get? <laughs> anyway, the prison authorities and my publishers made it happen. And yeah. I went out to this prison uh, one day and... Some 700 of those prisoners had put their hand or had written down on a piece of paper saying they wanted to come and, and, and meet me. The printing press there made posters and banners of the cover of the book and of my photo on them. And there were postcards, A4, big, everywhere. 100 men were selected. I don't know what they did to get selected. Probably good behaviour. But I sat in a room for two hours with these 100 men. And we just sat there talking, not always about Lali and Gita, quite the opposite. They wanted to talk about the most significant person in their life who was not with them, their family outside. And these men started sharing stories to other prisoners about their home life. They'd never done that before. These men are breaking down and weeping. It was crazy. And I just moved amongst them and would sit with 10 or 20 at a time and then one or two at a time. And just uh, once again, the, the talk was, there was no talk per se. We just gave that whole idea away when I realized they wanted to do the talking and they wanted to try and relate it to get, having a better life. And after that, just two hours was up and my publishers had sent along 100 books and said to, well, so they were said, oh, look, if you want a copy of the book, pick one up. 
And so they were all picking it up and looking at it and talking about it. And one of them said to me, oh, could I sign it for him? So I had to get a guard to give me a, a pen because I had been so thoroughly searched and to be able to get into there was worse than trying to get into Israel uh, airport. <laughs> if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I but um, I sat down and the first thing he said to me when I said what was his name, he said, oh, could you make it out to my mum? I went, oh, sure. So he gave me his mum's name and then he said, can you just write, I'm sorry, mum. I promise I won't come back inside again. Now, the guys standing behind him heard this. Now, all of a sudden, I've got man after man handing me a book and saying, oh, to my wife, please tell her I'm sorry she's raising the kids on her own. To my 16-year-old daughter, tell her how proud daddy is that she's got a job interview. To my partner, and then they'd whisper, does it matter that it's a man? This was going on and on, and I'm just sitting there frantically writing these incredible inscriptions for these men to give to the most important person outside their lives. I made one mistake that day, though, Jonathan. I'd been warned, you know, don't ask them anything. They want to volunteer stuff, that's fine. And mind you, I'd totally ignore that anyway. What's the point of talking to somebody if you can't have a two-way conversation? But at one point I looked up and there's this gentleman standing there and tears are streaming down his face. And he said, would I write it to his three-year-old daughter who he'd never met? She'd been born after he'd come inside and just say that he, he's going to be the best daddy in the world when he gets out. So I wrote that and I handed him back the book and he's wiping away tears. So I, I don't know what me think. I just looked at him and I went, do you want a hug? And he went, mm -hmm. So I got up and I gave him a hug. But the man next to him said, oh, can I have one too? I gave him a hug. And then I went, can I have one too? Can I have one? So all of a sudden, I'm just hugging until this guard came up and went, excuse me, love, I haven't touched a lady in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Hugs are off. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, live and learn. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think we had lunch with them. Yeah, a dozen of them were chosen then to come and we went and got our prison grub and sat at a table. And yeah, incredible yeah. experiences. That's how my yeah. life's changed. That's crazy. Yes. Much more yeah. meaningful than a new Ferrari. I agree. <laughs> yes. Uh, what's, uh, well, we've talked about it a little bit, but what today, what are you the most proud of when you think of all these stories, all, all the stories, all, all the effect you've had on people all around the world? Yeah. Being proud is not a, something that I kind of tag to myself. Uh, and it sounds sort of silly, but I, you know, what I'm most proud of is when I'm out with my grandchildren and they run into a bookshop and run up to the counter and just and say, have you got my grandma's book? Uh, and ask for them and, and see that they're all too young to read it, though the 10-year-old the is saying, I'm going to watch that miniseries, Grandma. Uh, well, it's up to your parents. But they don't know the stories and they will as they get older. But just to see how proud they are that, um, and several of them, the older ones, they've taken the book to schools and given it to their teachers, asked me to write in them. Uh, so funny enough, uh, that's where it comes down to. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to end with something that you said in an interview because I feel like it represents the true meaning of all these books because you said, by knowing about Lala and Gita, you know about all the others. And I think... Thank you for, for that, because I think it sums up everything. Well, thank you. And I'm going to actually qualify that in the end of my new book that's coming out. And uh, by simply making the statement, I have not written this because I want these women to be remembered. I've written it because I want them to be known about in the first place. Yes. And only by knowing about it can you then remember. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Heather, for taking the time to be here. This has been My great. My pleasure, Jonathan. Uh, once again, people can find you on Instagram at Heather Morris Author and on your website, heathermorrisauthor.com. And your new book, Sisters Under the Rising Sun, will come out shortly. So stay tuned for that. I'm sure it's going to be a great read. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, if you've enjoyed this conversation, if you would like to hear more, Don't forget to like, subscribe, and spread the word. 
can find all the information about this podcast and my activities as a writer on my website, hamiljonathan.com. All these conversations are available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you all and see you soon on The Creators. Thank you, thank you.